You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. To all of you watching and listening from around the world, this is the F11 Photography Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Deal, along with your other host, one Mr. Brandon Gorey. Hello, hello. Welcome back. How we doing? Yeah. Doing well, man. Uh, you know, just been super busy. What have you been up to lately? Well, I've been working a lot on the small business, doing some ill-found stuff. So that involves me getting a 3D printer. As it turns out, a uh, mold manufacturers are really not reliable around the world unless you're ordering tens of thousands of uh, silicone parts. So we decided to get a 3D printer. We're doing all of our designs in-house and we're rapid prototyping as we speak. So this is a coaster that's based off of a reservoir, right? Yes, the Industrial Floodgate Coaster. Modeled after floodgates around the world, the industrial brutalist concept. Uh, a lot of those are in China, actually. They make a lot of brutalist stuff over there. So if you want to stand in a bread line and wait for your <laughs> communist-issued uh, bread, <laughs> or even uh, stand in line waiting for your communist-issued milk, you have... Uh, a coaster to put your milk on top of now. This is made for you. Absolutely. So if you're into brutalism or uh, concrete, Ilfound, right? Yeah. Is it Ilfound.co? It's it's just Ilfound, but uh, that was taken on Instagram, so I had to put a .co. I mean, it looks more official, but uh, we had to put it in any case. Damn it. Well, <laughs> it happens, man. <laughs> hey, there's nothing more awesome and entrepreneurial, I don't even know if that's a word, uh, than launching your own product. And so uh, I always root for the successes of people who do launch their own products. Well, thank uh, you, Kevin. Speaking of entrepreneurs and launching your own products, I just launched my Styles Packs yesterday. I'm pleased to announce that my three Capture One Style Packs, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder are all now available for purchase on my website. Check out a link in the description of this video. And now, on to today's episode. So check those out. Uh, but it is funny because um, I actually, when I set up my preset packs, I, uh, I decided to, for a few months, do a campaign where I collected people's emails, but they had to take the steps to go to my... So so to, here, here was the process. I, 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 leading up to it, I was like, hey, I wanna, I'm going to launch these preset packs. And if you're interested, you have to go to kevindalephotography.com. That's step one. Step two is you have to scroll to the bottom of the homepage. Step three is you have to click on the, the field to put your email address in. Step four is you have to actually put your email address in. Yep. And step five, you actually have to hit submit. Okay? I'm with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So five steps. The reason I bring this up is it's just funny because uh, I had a, I had an email list. And the second I released them, I put an email blast out. Because I, I told people, like, this isn't you are signing up for this. You have to go through the five steps. Clearly, you're interested in this because I don't believe in buying email lists and then bombarding a billion people. Despite the fact that it may actually help my grow, grow my business, I feel like... Uh, I organically grew my YouTube channel and I feel like that if I were to like buy lists and start really targeting people, you know, like the equivalent of cold calling, I, I feel like I, I would violate, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, it's just not me, man. You know, look, I get it, but the email list is goaded. The email list will always be goaded and, and the returns are always, um, like, Phenomenal. Like the bang for buck is, we'll, is insane. We'll, we'll see, but as of right now, I only want to gauge who's super interested in it, and so I, I have people who have taken the five steps to sign up for the list. That's that's the most. That is a list of people who are super interested. Right. Anyway, point being is funny. I, I sent out my email blast, and within like two minutes, I got to unsubscribe from somebody who said I never signed up for this list. It's like, 
Well, I certainly as hell didn't sign you up for this list. Did a bot take five steps to sign you up for my list? Because I didn't sign you up for my list. Anyway, I just thought that was kind of funny. It's like, it's like, are you sure you didn't take the five steps to sign up for my list and you just didn't remember doing it? Like, so anyway, uh, but so far so good. Uh, the reception on, on it has been good. So check out uh, the link in the description below. If you are a capture one user, uh, I'll, I'll make it, I'll make it, I'll make it for Lightroom soon enough. Um, but I'm not going to make the same presets for Lightroom. I'm going to make some that are kind of based off of the Capture One presets Lightroom because sucks. Yeah, I mean, I it. It, hey, I'm not a fan of Lightroom, but uh, the majority of the people watching this use Lightroom. So uh, I, I would be, as a capitalist, uh, doing myself an incredible disservice by not making these for Lightroom. They're doing themselves a disservice by using Lightroom. Oh, we're about to get downvoted. All right. Uh, the <laughs> subject for today, like we're going to shift gears. We usually photo have... Photo editing for kids. Yeah, we usually we usually had a, have a sponsor, but we decided to plug our own stuff today, so whatevs. We don't need a sponsor. We don't need a sponsor today. Uh, so... So we are the sponsor. The subject of today's episode is we are going to talk about how to style a shoot. Okay. Um, so uh, things that we've learned over the years about styling shoots. Uh, I would do yeah, things I would recommend. And I am going to start in the very first place, which is uh, what makes a shoot better. And a styled shoot at that. Ooh. And yes, what makes a shoot better is having good, good angle. Ha having a team. Yeah, that's a good angle. What makes a shoot better? Having a team. Yeah, you're yeah. approaching it from the wide lens. Oh, you, you know it. You know. <laughs> well, like so, how to style a shoot? First and foremost, I am a photographer. Oh, yeah. Do I know how to do some very minor styling type stuff? Yes, but my ceiling for styling is here, mm -hmm. and a professional stylist floor is here, and their ceiling goes above the frame of your Nikon Z8. So. My number one piece of advice to all of you, and maybe the most important piece of advice to all of you, if you are into styling shoots, is let somebody else style it and then <laughs> just worry about being a photographer. That's the episode, how to style a shoot. <laughs> anyway, Get all the credits. A stylist. <laughs> I mean, That's it's, it. but it's true. And now your work doesn't end there because there's other considerations you have to make during a styled shoot, which we're going to talk about. So... Uh, so it's not even necessarily get a stylist, it's build a team, and that team includes a stylist. Because guess what I know about makeup? I could name you what types of makeup. Oh, that's blush. I think that's eyeliner. Um, you know, that's that's my, my knowledge of cosmetics. And so if my knowledge of cosmetics is below the table that you can't see in this frame. You listen here, and Janine. And the floor. We're going to go smoky eye with a little bit of cat wing, cat tail. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, that's not me, man. That's not me. The only thing I can tell you about makeup is when it's bad, because then I know I'm going to have to do a lot of retouching and my job just got worse. As a male, I can tell you when makeup's bad. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if if you're well, here, here, here's a guy. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just put I'll just be be frank. Any makeup artist where I can tell the makeup is bad, they're never getting hired by me ever again, because it's like I shouldn't like it should be so freaking good. That the, me who knows nothing about makeup should not go. Wow, that's shit. Yeah. Like, like if it's if 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 you produce that for me, you're never working with me again. Period. Like it's over. It's over. So, uh, and I've I've actually had that because I found that makeup artists, uh, when you like hire them, a lot of times they don't understand the assignment, and they think that oh, I have to show off as good as I can possibly be with so much makeup on the model's face that I, I just have to show off like my most complex makeup look I've ever done. And the assignment might be like a natural beauty shoot, right? Bro, like, I wish the makeup artists I work with did that. A couple of them do. But most of them are just like, all right, I'm going to do the contour that I learned at Paul Mitchell's makeup store. I think it's, I don't think Paul Mitchell does makeup. I think it's hair. But either way... Boy, we're outing ourselves for not knowing a lot about makeup. Paul Mitchell, uh, yeah, I think I think I think you got to get to like Revlon and Neutrogena. I saw and Paul Mitchell at EDC when it was back in LA. Was he like rolling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, I am rolling. Yeah, you ever seen that movie? That bit from Tombstone, uh, Val Kilmer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the point. <laughs> So the rest of the episode, we're going to talk about uh, people who have their own hairstyle brands rolling on ecstasy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, back to makeup and cosmetics, which is, uh, you know, hire people who are better than you at those areas. Let cooks cook, right? That's, right. To me, uh, that's it's the same goes for hair. Uh, you, you tell me to style anybody's hair, men or woman, and I don't care. I, I'm not going to do it well because it's like my, my job is to grab a camera and take pictures, right? I, there is there is somewhere deep down, Kevin, where you will just forego all the I'm not good at this, grab a can of hairspray and just fucking like, all right, a little bit of this, fuck it, need more there. Because it, it's, it's a medium, you know? It's a paintbrush. When you're painting red, sometimes a space without red just needs red, and that, that's enough. If you give me hairspray, I'd probably like... Light it, light it, and like make fire with it. Yeah, yeah. Turn someone into Marv or yeah. Harry and Home Alone. Yeah, so you probably want to like let the let the cook cook there and let the hairstylist do the hair. But to the point of styling a shoot, the number one thing you should do is hire a team and uh, grow with that team. So if you have like find a, find a makeup artist that can do pretty much everything you need them to do. Find a hairstylist that can do pretty much everything you need them to do. Find a wardrobe stylist that can pull any style. If you can right. develop a team in those three areas, uh, you're, you're pretty much able to do whatever you want at that point. Now, so, I 100% agree with you. But for the sake of the audience, I know that A, the majority of photographers are introverted and, and don't network. <laughs> and B, no one has the... Uh, no one's got the the wallet for hiring an entire team. Well, so, I'm also talking about like creative shoots, though, where you do t- where everybody's building their portfolio. Collaborating, still build a team of that because you can right. find stylists. We've talked about this in the past, which is find people who are at your level or maybe even slightly above your level who will help pull you up to their level. But build a team of people who are kind of in the same place as you. Find a stylist who's at the same level as you. Maybe find a makeup artist who's a little bit better than you. And, and develop a team that way, and you'll elevate each other's shoots, and you'll help each other's portfolios out. But we're talking about that as the ideal way right. to right. do a styled shoot. Now, what happens if you don't have that team? What do you do? Um, first and foremost, well, hold I st- on. What? Some something to qualify with a stylist is make sure like there's there's different like stylists, mm-hmm. right? You know, there's different people. Like you can get one stylist where you're hiring their taste, and the you know you show them a mood board, and they're gonna be like, oh, I know exactly where to buy these clothes. Yep. And that's that's kind of what they do. There's other stylists, if you live in a big enough city, to where you're buying their wardrobe, where they have hundreds of garments. They've got, um, they've got storage with hundreds of garments. And when you show them the mood board, they go out to their storage, they go to their closets, and they go, oh, where are the clothes, you know, that's going to work for the shoe? And so... You know, there's the, you're going to get charged a different rate. You know, it's just going to be a lot more collaborative if you're working with someone who has a closet. And so if you're living in a city that's large enough, try to find a stylist with a big closet that even you could probably look through and sort of like go, oh, yeah, this is definitely in the mood. I'm not a stylist myself, but this garment is is awesome. Uh, in addition to stylists, you could also look at designers. Now, Austin is not going to have as many designers as, say, New York City or Paris or London or Milan. But we do have some designers here, and I do work with them from time to time. But in general, you want a stylist because there's definitely more stylists in your city than there are designers in your city, unless like you live in those major fashion hubs. Uh, and even then, there's probably more oh, more stylists. Major f- but fashion hub, <laughs> like in, in, the, in the United in, States, in hub. New York. <laughs> but if, yeah. but but uh, in the world, there's there's a handful. Um, but uh, that's something to keep in mind: is you know, definitely have a team. Uh, and and if you can find a stylist, if you live in a smaller area and you can find a stylist, man, hold on to them because they are like gold. Yeah, they will elevate your shoots to a point that you can. Because like, I can I can kind of go. Uh, to a, I can create a mood board and show it to a model, and oftentimes a model can go, "Oh, okay, I have something in my 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 closet that's kind of like that," and we can put something together. But 
I would also say that uh, oftentimes if you have a stylist put just some badass piece of clothing on a model, that model's all of a sudden going to be way more motivated to give you a good performance in front of the camera because they're wearing something that they can't afford uh, as opposed to something that's already in their closet that they spent their money on. Hey, newsflash, most models in their early 20s don't have a lot of money, so they're not going to be buying, you know, $2,000 dresses and, you know, $500 tops and stuff like that. So uh, if you want to shoot a more high fashion leaning look you probably do need to rely on a stylist or a designer go ahead well okay the money thing there's i've got, i've got a gripe with that okay so yes a lot of models don't don't have the money but also a lot of models do at the same time depends i've shot a fair bit of models in austin who are from dallas with their parents money who are from New York with their parents' money or are just in Austin, happen to run like three businesses at the same time and just have a shit ton of money and they're from, you know, bumfuck Egypt. So there are people where they're just like, yeah, no, just send me the clothes you want. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, cool, $150 dress. They're like, cool, do you, do you need anything better than that? I'm like, better, oh. And that that does happen fairly often, especially in, especially in bigger cities. You, you bring up a good point. So... Uh, we've talked ad nauseum on this pod that social media is fake, that people, uh, exaggerate their lives. There is hyperbole there and models are, are not, uh, immune to this. I see this a lot. You'll see a model who will say, Oh, uh, I'm Austin based, but I'm also New York based and I'm also LA based. Or I'll see a model that says, oh, I travel around a lot. And then you like do a little more investigative research and they're married to like a minor league baseball player who travels <laughs> around the country. It's like, oh, I, you just like, oh, why are you in Philadelphia today? Why yeah. are you in such and such city? Because you're because you're following your spouse's job around there, or whatever. This is <laughs> one model I know in Austin. I, I haven't shot with them, but it's like I, I see them at HEB, our local grocery store every now and again, just in their pajamas, just fucking grabbing rice or whatever. And then on their Instagram store, I'm just, they're just like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Dubai for the third time this year. And I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. So, so anyway, uh, point being is, is those people may actually have access to money because they may have really rich spouses who play for major league baseball. Uh, but that also brings up another point. Um, if you find yourself needing to be a stylist, a practice that is absolutely normal in the styling world is buying clothes and returning them. So yep. you could go to a boutique. Now, oftentimes it's understood. Yep. Like if you say, hey, I'm a stylist, you go into a really nice store and say, hey, I'm a stylist or I'm a photographer who's styling a shoot. I'm going to buy these clothes and I'm going to return them. Oftentimes the boutique is in on it. And sometimes you you can plug them. You can say, hey, I bought this from this boutique and they have this duar or whatever the hell you're, you're, you're styling out. Um, that's an idea you could do. Uh, of course you have to have the capital to float it for a bit. So if you buy $2,000 worth of clothes, you have to have $2,000 temporarily to spend on the clothes. Cap credit, card. credit, credit, credit cards, are credit cards are there for a reason, but yep. just make sure you don't screw yourself over in that regard. Yep. But that is an option. If you find yourself needing to style, yeah. um, obviously another piece of advice for styling is mood boards. Yeah, we've talked about the importance of mood boards on this pod several times. Um, but uh, when it comes to styling and mood boards, Brandon, how do mood boards help you style shoots? Um, well, they really influence the mood, Kevin. Wow. <laughs> so we have given you valuable insight today. Uh, I'm going I'm to okay. talk about a well, camera and say okay. you push a, a, a... Well, mood boards... There's a, there's a lot of wrong ways to do a mood board. And you're probably thinking to yourself like, gosh, do I really want to listen to this guy talk about the wrong ways to do the mood boards? And absolutely, fuck yes. A lot of people, when they do mood boards, including myself when I, um, when I used to do mood boards, is you literally, you look at the photo and you're like, oh gosh, I'd love to shoot that. You look at a photo that's somewhat related in, in like the tones or whatever, you're like, God, I want to shoot that. And you go, I want to shoot that. And... You end up with this hodgepodge that doesn't really help your process. It just gives you a, a massive indecision because you've got a collection of photos that you all like. You can't narrow them down. And, and now you've got different makeup looks. You've got different clothing styles. And you've got um, different posturing for, for different things. And now some people are just like, oh, I don't have that problem because they're, they're good at this stuff. You know, this is like something that they put a lot of intention into and a lot of deliberation. But for... 
for for someone like trying to make a mood board, you want it to help your styling. Sometimes I'll do a mood, mood board for the makeup only, where I'm just like, I want this style of makeup. And I have to make sure it's the same style of eyeshadow across the board, same style of, of uh, lipstick on the same type of skin. And I go, okay, cool. That's the mood board for the, uh, for the makeup artist so that they have absolutely no confusion on where I want to go with the shoot. Second mood board is the clothing. It's a clothing mood board. So you have to make sure that all the clothing is succinct. You're not looking at the postures. You're not looking at the model. You're looking at the clothing and probably the same style of lighting. And that's another mood board I'll make for the stylist. A third mood board is for myself. What kind of postures? You know, the, the crazy mood board is for me. I want a mood board to rely on where it's just kind of like, you know, a little bit inspiring. So if I'm hitting kind of like a dead zone in the shoot or I've exhausted the five things I wanted to shoot, I can look at this mood board and go, oh yeah, that would be a great shot. And the camera's already positioned and the light's already positioned that way. So when it comes to mood boards, make sure you're making the mood boards with a goal in mind. Don't just create a, oh, I'd love the shoot to be like this. Otherwise you're going to get lost in the sauce every time. Yeah, I, I approach mood boards in two different ways. Um, for a very specific shoot where I want to control every aspect, I will do what Brandon does. I will uh, I use Canva, so I'll use Canva, and then I'll have one page be, this is the overall vibe of the shoot. And the vibe, by vibe, I might go, it's an outdoor environmental portrait shoot in a urban area. So I'll have a bunch of pictures of something in a city. That'll be kind of like my setting. So it's, you know place. Uh, and then I'll also, oh, another thing I do is I have a little swatch palette on every page that, uh, will have my color scheme on it. And I use a very important program. There's two programs you can use out there. And I use these also in conjunction and coordination with my stylist, uh, which is, I will use a, um, a website called Peloton, not to be confused with Peloton, the failing, uh, uh spin cycle, a company that apparently is having record losses, but uh, Peloton. And what's cool about Peloton is you can take, let's just say that there's a primary color you want to be your base color. You can use an eyedropper tool and eye drop it on your screen. And then you can tell it if you want a triad, you can tell it to find complementary colors. You can be, was it mono, mono legalis or how the hell, how the hell you say that homogenous, homogenous where everything's kind of in the same area. Did you try to say mono legalis? Yeah, I, I totally uh, <laughs> crashed and burned on that. So uh, point being is, is there are all different types of ways that you can, it, it, it'll just say, oh, well, based off your, your base color, you need these other colors. I use the hell out of that, especially when someone like get, puts the burden on me, like you have to do the whole like design of the shoot, the mood board. I will absolutely use that. But also um, when a stylist comes back with me with their polls, what comes back at me with their polls, they'll be like, here's all the stuff I've got for the shoot. And I have to choose, let's say I'm doing a studio shoot and I need to choose background colors. I will use the eyedropper tool and I'll just look and go, oh, okay, this would go well with like a beige backdrop or something like that. So I cheat with that. Peloton, it's free, it's online. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because not everybody uses Adobe, but if you do have an Adobe account, uh, maybe even a little bit better than Palaton is something called Adobe Color. And Adobe Color is like Palaton as well. It's very specific. It will show you the colors uh, that you can use that are complementary, uh, tertiary, those kinds of things. So uh, if you, you know, you, if you tell, I mean, I have four colors I want to use, you know, based off your eyedropper for your, your primary color, it'll be like, these are the four colors you should use. And so it's a cheat tool. It's a good cheat tool because a lot of you watching this might be really good photographers, but that may not be your strong suit. Like, like for instance, when I was plugging my Capture One style, some of you need a little help getting you where you need to be uh, for edits, or if you're not somebody like Brandon who lives for like doing the stuff in, in post. And it's the same with color. You may be really good at framing shots. You may be really good at capturing uh, stories, but you may suck at color. And so if you suck at color, if you use Adobe Color or you use Palaton, those can help you get where you need to get a little faster. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to styling as well, you know, it's uh, like I said, it might not be your strong suit. It's not my strong suit. I've got, you know, like we've got ceilings where we're kind of like we can kind of see it. 
but anything anything beyond that is just like, oh gosh, I never would have put the you know that scarf with that pink mini skirt. Like that's that is, crazy. That is literally why I have a team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is why. That is why uh, when you find a stylist, you take them out to lunch every now and then. You really rub those shoulders and make them feel good about themselves because uh, I'm telling you, man, uh, stylists have taken my shoots like from here to up here before, just because it's like holy crap, I would have never thought to put those two things together, and I'm like okay. N- that, that, I find that the value of a good stylist is, you know, a lot of you, you get into this because you want to be a photographer and you just want to be a photographer. And all of a sudden you find yourself having to be a stylist. That sucks if that's not what you want to do. I don't want to be a stylist. I okay. do like I like photographing good styling, but I hate styling, which is why I have other people do it. But, but at the same time, if you have a personal shoot that's a little bit out there, you know, like I had a shoot with chain mail. You had a shoot with a diver's helmet. Yes. Who's got that? Yeah. Who? Nobody. You can't, yeah. Well, so, and that's that's you find you yourself get, needing you to gotta style di- your own shoots. Yeah. You, you got to diversify. You know, when Gucci's coming out with the chainmail shoots, and you're like, God, I got to step up my game. Where are you gonna find that, Kevin? Uh, where are you finding that? Yeah, I don't think the stylist is gonna know where to find chainmail. So sometimes you, if you have an out there shoot, you're going to have to style it yourself. You've Brandon gotta Mills. go to Etsy. Look at this. <laughs> Etsy. I get, the, Look at that! It's Etsy cheap. chain mail, yeah. Etsy chain mail. I, I bought my dive helmet on eBay. That's another place I go to find e- stuff for styling. eBay, you know? So. You can type in spandex on Etsy and really lewd photos will come up as well. I'm not going to do that here, but you can do it. <laughs> you can do you it. Can do it. <laughs> um, so, great, great point. So I think I think if you're watching this, you have a little better understanding of, hey, get a team if you can. But if you don't have a team, you're going to have to do a lot of this on your own. Yep. So you now have a place to find your kind of out there styling. You know that, uh, OK, if I form some sort of a relationship with a fashion boutique that has stuff in the style I want it to be in, you could do that. You buy it, you return it. That's another thing. Oh, yeah. but when it comes to color coordination, you can use Adobe Color and you can use Palaton. Uh, but let's talk about things that you also need to think about when you're actually doing the shoot. So one of the things that I usually like to do to make a shoot more interesting is to have depth. Mm. Okay. So if you're trying to showcase some sort of fashion or some sort of styling, a lot of times uh, having more depth will draw attention to it. It could be sheets behind you. It could be having something that's out of focus in the foreground. It draws the eye to, uh, (laughs) The, the, the piece that you're trying to show off, I definitely think depth is something that adds, adds yeah, unless you want to make it look like a lookbook, in which case you can just shoot it against a white backdrop, but yeah. it all depends on what your intention is. But if you want your, sh- your shoot to stand out and actually be worth looking at and maybe have it look a little bit more editorial, it's very rare that you'll see in like Vogue or those magazines that they're just standing in front of a white backdrop because it looks too much like a lookbook. Yeah, and you got you to gotta balance the outfit with the environment. So, guess what? If you're shooting in front of a bed sheet, a white backdrop, you can go to town with your outfit. Your outfit can have all the details, all the chains and dongles and bells and whistles. It can have all the fucking texture it needs because you've got a white backdrop. Now, say you're shooting in an urban environment. There's cars going by. There's broken concrete everywhere. There's litter. There's bushes and and plants creeping out of the cracks and different shit going on, and you can't control all of it. You're going to want something minimal. Yeah. You're going to want to go with, like, a single color. You're going to want to go with low texture. You're, you're going to want to focus on facial expressions and posture. You're going to want to isolate, baby. You want to isolate. So you got to really understand what the hell you're trying to do. Are Because you, you can't have all this texture and detail and put it in front of in, in a city scene unless you're going to strobe the subject which which takes them out of the out of the environment you know you really got to understand the balance of how the fuck do i portray this outfit best and it kind of goes back to something we talked about over a year ago are you shooting the person or are you shooting the clothes and that really that's a whole other conversation in and of itself oh i struggle with that because Oftentimes, my photography, I want to focus it around the person and their character, and they happen to be wearing clothes. Uh, yeah, I mean, they happen to be wearing like style, stylish clothes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just nude. It's like, here's a boob. Uh, I, I hate it when my models are happy. 
<laughs> they happen to wear clothes. They just happen to be wearing clothes. Uh, but no, like I, I tend to like to tell stories. And so I struggle with that sometimes. It's like, well, if the story is like, how much, how much uh, does the styling dominate the story versus the story itself? And I, I struggle with that balance uh, a lot, actually. So. So, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it gets to a point where the the styling is more of a statement. And you, you kind of have to throw the story out the window because there is no story. It's just a fucking designer dress. You know, the story is lust <laughs> and the story is high fashion and the story is uh, decadence. And you just fucking it's just one big gravity pit of look at me and then, OK, cool. Next, you know, you're on to the next thing. Oh, definitely. Definitely. But uh, I, to Brandon's point, uh, if I were to. Uh, take something from that it would be less is more a lot of times like oh yeah like yeah you want depth but if you have a crazy pattern and you have crazy stuff going on like a, a, a city scene where there's a bunch of stuff going on in the background everything's just going to get lost it's just going to like drown in itself and it's not necessarily going to make for a, a good good shoot so you know you, you, it's always because when we had the discussion about focal length we talk about hey there's certain focal lengths where you know what who your subject is and then there's certain focal lengths where your subject might get lost but you can also lose or define your subject based off of how everything's styled if you have you know it's like uh, in the matrix when they talk about the lady in the red dress she stands out because that whole scene is very chill, very, you know, desaturated, very brutalist, which makes Brandon super happy. Uh, but then there's a woman in a red dress there and it's like, damn, she stands out. Like, so, so those types of artistic decisions, which the, the director of cinematography made for that movie, like, Hey, this is going to be an awesome scene because we're going to have this really awesome color that pops out. You make those same types of decisions when you shoot photography. I mean, you, you, you should make those same types of decisions when you shoot photography. Absolutely. And what's also funny is like as a photographer, Kevin says, you know, you don't want to wear the stylist, the, the makeup hat. You don't want to wear those hats. But by virtue of, ooh, hello, by virtue of being a photographer, you're going to have those hats on regardless. Because that's just, the, you know, you want to be a photographer. You want to learn some things. You know, before you can have a stylist, before you can have a makeup artist, before you can have a hair person, before you reach out, you're going to be having these ideas in your head of how you want the shoot to go. And so there is sort of a, a sort of a hat. It's like the Yankee, you know, a brimless hat, if you will. Like maybe it's a yarmulke. It's not the full hat, but you're definitely wearing one. So uh, with that being said, like there are some times where I've had, well, <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> most times in my photography career, actually, I have appropriated uh, clothing or something for the model to wear. And to Kevin's great point is these boutiques will absolutely, uh, they'll lend you clothes uh, in knowing that you're going to return them. But also um, there are two two places that I know a lot of people go to buy clothes and then return them. And like these places are kind of down with that. They're like, they're kind of into it. And let me just switch you over to the, uh, yep. So the first place is ASOS. Um if you're living in the 21st century, you probably know what this is. But for people who don't, um, it's it's very it's like stylish basics that are very affordable. And when you uh, when you buy them online, they ship a bag to the door to the door with you, so that you can package it back up and send it back in. It's really really cool. So they got they got literally everything. I don't even know if I need to go any further because their marketing is so good. And they have like it's there's also one called like Rent the Runway, right? No yes. Cool. Yeah, because I've had I've had some traveling models. Uh, I don't really shoot traveling models that often, but I've had some come through town. Uh, that we have mutual admiration for each other, and they they'll go they'll buy or get some rent the runway stuff. They'll rent some rent the runway stuff and go travel to cities with it. So they have very different looking clothes in those particular cities. And then when they get back home, they just send all the stuff back. Yeah, like like look at this. Look at this. Forty five bucks. Boom. You know, 1993, here I come. Stone Temple Pilots music video. Yeah, All Brandon right. would love to wear that for sure. That's that's totally your style. I used to rave and I used to wear stuff like that. The next thing. Just next have thing. the pierced nipples with the, the chain in between and you're good to go, dude. I used to wear the candy up to my elbows. <laughs> up to my fucking elbows. No comment. Plur life. <laughs> 
I'll trade you one pressed Bernie Sanders for a pink dolphin. All right. Anyways, um, another <laughs> another place you can go to is Zara. Now I'm on the <laughs> women's section. Kevin's just beaming at me here because he knows exactly what I'm talking about, but doesn't want to come to the gutter with me. So so here again, look at Zara. Like a little bit more expensive, but also like you're not. 60 bucks for this draped lingerie dress. That's incredible. You're doing something more like a uh, slip satin, slip silk, uh, boom, right here. It's great. They've got a lot of occasions and the photography is already amazing. Like technically this could be a mood board um, in and of itself, but this is all just to say that like, you know, you've got options, you know, it's more of a summer, summer vibe. Boom. There we go. Absolutely. I mean, this is fucking sick, but that's 170 bucks. So maybe not. Again, really cool. Asymmetrical crocheted tunic dress. Well, you can do the $170. You just have to have a spouse who plays Major League Baseball. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Or, you, or you just return it and get, the, get your yeah. credit card money back. Yeah. But, but that's to say that, like, you know, if, if you're someone as a photographer and you have a specific idea and you just, you, you know, you don't need slash want to go through a stylist, even though they're probably better than you, you do have options. And you can also, like, you can also parlay with the model and say, like, hey, you're, we're doing this for TFP. My portfolio is a little bit better than yours, and I will be elevating you. You won't be elevating me so much. Go spend the money on that dress, and we'll play ball. You know, and that's that's not like a power dynamic thing. That's just a hey, let's make this even. You know, let's let's provide value where value needs to be provided. Um, so that's definitely something that I've done. Um, you know, in the same way though, I've gone to pitch. You know, with a model who was a lot more experienced than I was. And I'm just like, fuck, you know, I can't believe this person is doing TFP with me. I, you know, shit, I'm going to go, I'm going to bring some stuff. Hey, what's your size? Hey, here's the mood board. This is what I want to do. I'll, I'll worry about the garments. Thank you so much. Like, let's do this for, you know, thank you so much for five hours of your time. You know, so there's, there's, there's no one size fits all. And you just really got to play ball with what's available. And thankfully there's a lot available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Something I do want to talk about, maybe a little nuanced conversation here, is uh, if you are shooting for a brand, the logo makes sense. But let's say you're doing a styled shoot for a model's portfolio, and maybe their styling is they need to do athletic wear, okay? But they need to be hired for a bunch of different types of projects of athletic wear, right? Take the Nike logo off. Take the Adidas logo off. Take the Puma logo off. You don't want to see the logos. Those need to look generic. However, if you're shooting for Tommy Hilfiger or Lacoste or somebody like that, you do want to see the logo because that is what they do. Or the the Ralph Lauren logo, which pretty soon uh, it's gotten so big over the years that it's going to be like you just hold this gigantic <laughs> like polo horse thing. And then it's just like attaches to your shirt and then you have like a polo shirt. So it's gotten so big. It looks so stupid. It used to be like this and then it like went over the shoulder. Now it's like Burr. like, but point being is, is hide the logos and be cognizant of that. Like, oh, I, I, I need to you know, get rid of this logo in post-production because if you deliver something with a Nike logo on it, like I made that mistake once I, I delivered a. Uh, um, I've delivered something to an agency for someone's portfolio and they're like, uh, can you get, could you remove the Nike logos, please? Like, oh yeah. Cause they might be trying to attract Adidas or Puma or, you know, Under Armour for a particular project. And like these companies apparently get butt hurt when they see somebody wearing somebody else's logo yeah. because Just they can't, they can't imagine any world other than their own because they're, they're, you know, yeah. It's just, it's just diligence. You know, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but it's just like, it's just diligence, you know? If, yeah. If if you're sending shit to if you're sending stuff to Adidas or you're working with Adidas and they want to see some stuff like they don't you, you don't want to send them shit with Nike on them you know that's just that's just common sense like don't do that you know yeah yeah well as a matter of fact there is an example of this there's a model that both uh, Brennan and I have worked with okay. and she recently just got signed uh, to an agency in Portland oh, and okay. you have both <laughs> Nike and Adidas there uh, and. Uh, she's gotten work with Nike already, and when I shot some work, when I when I did her portfolio, she was not wearing Nike clothing, but we took care of that because we we took the logo logo out or whatever, and and so it all worked out. So uh, just something to keep in mind: real world experience I can draw from. Speaking of. Uh, logos, we should also talk about tags. So be mindful of where tags are and how you're going to shoot it because 
man, that can create a ton of work for you in post-production uh, if you're not paying attention to that kind uh, of stuff. Uh, Kevin brought up a killer point. When you're when you're balls deep in the in the fo- in the photo shoot, you know when you're just in there and you're already you you know you go from the body setting up to just you're all up here. You're like, okay, how do I you know the posture, the lighting, and you're looking at all that. I can guarantee you, you're not looking at tags, you're not looking at creases that have formed over the the duration of the shoot. You're not looking at how how the clothing's draping in a weird way. Like you're just not looking at that. This stuff. is why you should hire a stylist because they will do it during the shoot. But go on. Exactly, they will come <laughs> in and they'll say, hold it. This person's robe is not looking correct. And then they go in and they're just like, and then it's just like, it just comes together and you're just like, holy shit. Oh yeah. That brings up a point. So like a lot of you watching this are egotistical photographers who are like, this is my set and this is my art and so on and so forth. I am. Well, well, hold on, hold on. (laughs) When I, when I'm on my set, the reason I call it my set is because of liability and safety reasons. I'm the one who gets sued if somebody hurts themselves. So in that sense, it is my set. But when it comes to like, Hey, if I have a, a hairstylist who's just looking at the hair while I shoot and I have a makeup who's just looking at the makeup while I shoot and I have a, a, a wardrobe stylist who's paying attention to the wardrobe as I shoot, I don't have to pay attention to any of that. So what I tell all of them is while this appears to be my set, you better speak up if, if something is wrong because you know what I don't want to do? I don't want to Photoshop creases out of the next 15 shots. I don't want to Photoshop stray hairs if I don't have to. And if there's some sort of smudginess with the makeup that needs to be quickly corrected, speak the hell up and tell me because it'll save me so much time post-production. And I sit down with my team and I tell them that before the set, like, do not suffer in silence if something's wrong. Stop the shoot. I'm going to get way more mad at you for not stopping the shoot than for stopping the shoot. I Nothing frustrates me more than having to Photoshop flyaway hairs on a gradiented I, background. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. I, I want to, I just, I just want to just right here. I, I can't stand that. Yeah, I shoot shallow depth of field a lot and you'll, I'll shoot somebody who's backlit by trees and you've got the greenery and you've got just those tiny little bouquet balls of light coming through. It is hard. It is not fun to take hairs out in front of that because oh it'll gosh. fuck your bouquet up all, all day. And you're just like, oh, man, I had this nice, smooth bouquet on this shallow depth of field. And now I can I can see this weird anomaly, this artifact occurring behind him that I'm having a really hard time, whether I use the spot heel, whether I use the patch. What it doesn't doesn't matter what I do. I'm like, shit. It's, it's it would have like just been easier if there wasn't hair there. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it gets to like a point where it's way too complex for Photoshop. Um that's, I mean, that's another thing is like having an assistant on set, you know? Yeah, well, having three assistants, that's what I'm saying. If you have a team, you have three assistants. By the way, you can, a lot of times, uh, the, 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 because these people are mutually invested in the outcome, I mean, I've always been like to the, to like a, a hairstylist. If I go, hey, will you hold this reflector? I've never had them go, no. They're like, yeah, I want the hair to glow. Like they'll hold reflectors for you, which is great. And that elevates your shoot. <laughs> I, I had this one guy, um, he recently moved to New York from Dallas. Great, uh, great makeup artist and hairstylist. I had him hold a reflector for three hours in a hundred five degree heat for his shoot once, and I'm, <laughs> he was phenomenal. That was a, that was a shitty shoot. Um, that not not on our part, um, but the the model uh, recently she got dropped immediately after that shoot. Uh, from the agency, but oh, wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She asked me three times for the raw images, and I'm like, "You're not <laughs> getting the fucking raw images. <laughs> yeah. Go away. Never, never, ever. Like, here's a list of things you're never getting from me. Number one, the raw images. The raw, it's not happening. Yeah. You can beg. It's just they're gone. I'm sorry. Like they're locked away. They're in cold storage under my house. Uh, like, under like my what? What percentage of models even have a, a computer in programs that can open up raw files? They they have this plan. They have this scheme. They're like, I'm gonna choose the best photo that the photographer missed. Send it to my by my, my photo person. They're gonna edit it, and I'm gonna post it on Instagram. No thanks. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, just, like, I don't know. Kick that to the curb. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh, I thought, I thought you were shaking hey. your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was just pointing at you, but yeah, uh, shake your hand. It's fine. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, where were we? <laughs> where uh, were we talking you, about? You had someone get dropped after a shoot, and you had an assistant holding a reflector for a very long period of time. Yeah, and just just to the point is, it, it's I don't mean to like abuse your assistants while they're on set. I do. But, uh, <laughs> 
I mean, I'm I'm more readily like able to abuse myself for the for the artistic thing, and then I'll just let everyone, you guys, just chill. I'm gonna like I'm gonna suffer here unless I need a like a second hand. Um, but at sometimes sometimes the assistants don't see the, the see the vision, and the, they can end up like just making more work for you. Yeah, it depends. Like, uh, like other photographers work really well as assistants because you can say, "Hey, I need a sixty-inch octobox on this light. Like, can you change it out?" And they'll know what you're talking about. There are certain things I let assistants do and encourage them to do, and there are certain things that I'll never let them do. So, like, like when I'm setting up or taking down, and like, can I help? I'm always like, no. Like, <laughs> it will take me more time to explain to you how to set up my modifiers than it would just be to set up the modifiers on my own. So, no, you cannot help me because, no offense, you do hair and you don't know how to do any of this stuff. So I don't want to teach you unless yeah. we're unless you want to become my full-time assistant uh, and work with me on every shoot. In that case, maybe you train them once and then they do it from that point onward. But in general, I don't – when it's – set up and take down time unless people are simply carrying something from the car to the location i don't want their help but holding a reflector yeah i'm gonna put your ass to work recording behind the scenes yeah i'm gonna put your ass to work like i'll find stuff for you to do on my set for sure so uh is there anything else you want to talk about on how to style a shoot something that's near and dear to your heart that you want to you want to get out off your chest go crazy whenever you're styling a shoot go crazy even if it's a basic shoot and it's it's just um, it's for an agency. You're doing test stuff. You're doing lookbook stuff. Just very basic stuff. Bring something fun. I always tell um, my my models when I'm doing portfolio updates. I'm like, cool, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do the you know cookie cutter. We might go a little bit edgier if we're you know shooting for New York agencies. Um, you bring your you bring your your your, your uh, sheer chainmail clip on yeah clip pierce on nipple clip rave on rave things. stuff yeah. with you something fun yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah like a feel the burn headband with a Rick and Morty like you know sticker tattoo things yeah sure <laughs> no what bring something fun like I told this one model I said you know uh, bring all the stuff you'd normally bring which is just very very you know collared cotton shirts and just you know loose fitting and tight fitting stuff black and white plain shirts and then also bring something wild like let's you know if you have any hunting boots like duck boots or something like that or waders go ahead and bring that a fucking your craziest belt and maybe like some other crazy boots and your your girlfriend's biggest sunglasses or whatever like always have something crazy in the back pocket because you never know when the Adderall is going to kick in and you're just going to feel like going absolutely nuts with creativity. <laughs> no, I'm you, you never know when you're going to want to get really creative or like at the end of the shoot, you've got the base shots done and then you get into the fun zone and you get a little something extra. Uh, sounds like I need to invest in some duck boots. Yeah. I've never done a duck boot shoot, so maybe maybe I should put that on my uh, my list of things to try. Well, the guy that I asked was a country boy, uh, or seemed like a country boy, and he was going for New York, and he was really good. He's a great model, but I was just like, bring some fun shit, bring some crazy crazy stuff. My go to for the country girls is cowboy boots because they always have those. Bring your cowboy boots. Yeah, uh, cowboy boots. Hey, cowboy boots are comfortable. Ah, uh, sure. So are Crocs. Wouldn't shoot them. I love cowboy boots. So uh, anyway, all right. Well, uh, I think we're going to call it a day on uh, episode number 16 of season two. Oh, yeah. That does it for today's episode. Oh, yeah. We want to thank each and every one of you for checking out today's episode. F11pod.com is where you can find us. You can find us on all the socials at F11pod. We don't use social media, but if you want to support us there, you can. Uh, obviously, if you like what you saw today, heard today, click the subscribe button below. We do appreciate the support. And uh, yes, kids, until next time, chase light and not algorithms. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.